Hey everyone, welcome back to Here in Apologetics. I'm so pumped you're joining us today to have Justin Schieber of Real Atheology and we're going to be talking about the problem of divine hiddenness. Uh, as always, this podcast is brought to you by you guys. So if you value what we do, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash here in apologetics. You can support for as little as a dollar a month, but let's get rolling. So Justin, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm excited today to talk about the problem of divine hiddenness. Um, it's a very like interesting topic, and I know you have a lot of thoughts about it. So to get rolling, Justin, do you want to talk a little bit about like who you are and what you do before we get into this? Um, sure. So yeah, as you mentioned, my name is Justin. Um, I am, well, I run a podcast uh, called the uh, Real Atheology Podcast. Uh, it's a philosophy of religion podcast from a atheist or like naturalist perspective. Um, I do that with uh, Ben Watkins, who uh, some of your listeners uh, and viewers may know. Um, yeah, so we're just really interested in exploring these questions. We try to approach it from a more like philosophically uh, minded approach. Um, and so, yeah, we really like to engage with, um, you know, theists, uh, much like yourself, who are very much interested in like the, the kind of nitty gritty of the philosophical issues surrounding religious belief and things like this. Well, it's awesome. And I have a lot of kind of words to say, but I'll say those kind of words till the end once we get all through, like, heavy <laughs> like stuff and I'll see if I still like you afterwards. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, so let's just start with this, Justin. Like what broadly is the problem of divine hiddenness? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So I think that at least how I take it, um, as I understand it, the broad problem of divine hiddenness uh, is a phrase that refers to like a collection of worries, both philosophical and theological that arise from the fact that either the felt presence of, the nature of, or the existence of God is somewhat less clear than we might expect it to be if, um, if such a God existed. Um, and so an example of this, like the felt presence problem, uh, for example, so you take your toddler to, um, you know, a, a medical establishment for a shot, right? they're too young to really understand what's about to occur and you can't really explain it to them. They're just too young. They, they won't get it. And they're about to experience some pain. Um, and so it would, it would seem like it would be a pretty natural assumption that if a father brings this child uh, to this situation, that the, the child is going to feel betrayed by, by this, right? Um, so what the father can do if, if he is in fact a loving father uh, is that he would be a calming and comforting presence to that child. Um, this is kind of what we would expect of, per, of parents generally. Um, and so one might want to raise the question of, okay, well, is it the case that sometimes when theists are at their darkest, are at their lowest point in life, when they need it most, do they feel God's comforting presence? Some theists report that the answer to this question is no, and of course not all of them. Um, but that fact that some do report that the answer is no to that question might seem surprising on the assumption that, uh, that God exists. And so there are a couple of interrelated questions there, right? So in uh, debates about the existence of God generally, you have like the problem of evil, right? And so some, uh, at least in my interactions, there's a tendency among theists to make a distinction between um, more philosophical questions like the logical problem of evil and the evidential problem and put those on this side and then put uh, the emotional problem of evil on this side. Um, kind of set that aside. That's a pastoral problem to be dealt with, right? That's not really a philosophical problem. But I think that that kind of move is too quick. Um, because of this kind of felt presence problem. Whereas you might want to make that distinction, but in, in a sense, a, um, the emotional problem of evil turns into a philosophical problem of hiddenness. Um, and so that's the, th these are the kind of like broad general worries that are associated with, with hiddenness concerns. Um, other things are like, you know, uh, uh, religious disagreement and various things like that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, this is helpful, Justin. So what's going to happen is, is Justin's going to take about like five to 10 minutes uh, to present like a, a problem of the hiddenness that, argument that he would defend. And after that, we're going to look at some objections and talk through it. Um, and then we'll be done and have a, our merry evenings. Um, so Justin, when you're ready, I'm going to take myself off the screen and feel free to just like defend your problem of like divine hiddenness that you find like plausible. Sure, sure. Yeah, so um, when it comes to uh, versions that I... Uh, you know, find plausible or that I find most interesting. Um, I've defended like a, a couple of arguments within this broad category, right? But um, at least with regard to the one that I find the most interesting, uh, it'd be by um, philosopher J.L. Schellenberg. Uh, he has an argument that highlights a particular form of non-belief in God uh, in an effort to show, excuse me, that God does not exist. And the way this argument kind of unfolds itself is it begins from the concept of a uh, perfectly loving God and asks what we might expect of perfect love. Uh, so it seems that we could, you know, perfect love, people are going to have different ideas about love, but there are going to be some core statements that can be said. Um, so you might think that uh, love is relational and self-giving. That seems like an incredibly plausible and controversial notion. Uh, perfect love spills over, pushing beyond mere benevolence and toward a desire to be personally related and involved with another for its own sake. Uh, so loving persons would also desire conscious, meaningful, explicit relationships with those they love because of the various ways in which those involved might stand to benefit from such a relationship. Um, and so kind of unpacking that concept of love, uh, Schellenberg brings us to the first premise of the argument. And this premise states that if a perfectly loving God exists, then there exists a God who is always open to a personal relationship with any finite person. And so some clarifications are, are in order here. Uh, what do we mean by personal relationship? Well, here Schellenberg wants to talk about a conscious interactive and positively meaningful relationship. Well, what about finite persons? Well, these are persons that are created by God. Now, interestingly, in a world where God freely chooses to become a cosmic parent, the existence of finite persons actually helps to illuminate the kinds of goods that God would be after, right? So namely, we're talking about relationship compatible goods. And so in a sense, these kind of relationship compatible goods will serve as a kind of framework. Uh, they'll, they'll be elevated to a framework status in such a world. Because of course, God is not necessarily going to create persons. He's not necessarily going to create anything. Um, but he, you know, if, if God exists in this world, it, it is the case that he's created persons. It is the case that he's created persons of a particular sort. Um, namely, he's created persons who are morally and relationally immature. Right. I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. I'm just saying that that does uh, put a bit of a frame to the discussion here. Um, and so next concept in this uh, premise, this first premise would be the concept of openness. And by this, we're just it's a very thin concept. Um, it does not really make much suggestion of God in this sense. Um, it does not suggest that God needs to, for example, actively pursue people. Uh, divine openness is consistent with God giving the finite person ample opportunity uh, as to how the relationship begins, how they enter that relationship, and how it develops from there on. Um, openness simply means not being closed. To paraphrase Schellenberg, God will see to it that nothing he does or fails to do ever puts relationship with himself out of reach for finite persons that he has created. Um, another quote that I, I like here is, uh, he writes, how could God at some time count as loving John or Joan as fully and richly as God can if God at that time is preventing John or Joan from being able to participate in any way in a meaningful conscious relationship with God? So this kind of brings us to our second premise. If there exists a God who is always open to personal relationship with any finite person, then no finite person is ever non-resistantly in a state of non-belief in God. And so some clarifications here as well. Because the goods made possible by explicit relationship with God require belief in God, 
God's reasons for openness to relationship entail that God's non-resistant loved ones are going to be in possession of belief in God. Now, those goods require explicit belief for multiple reasons. Remember that a relationship with God is good for its own sake and good because of the um, possible benefits to the participants, both of God and uh, possible persons. Um, but one of the most important goods here is it's, it's the key to a recognition of our self-value and fulfillment as created persons it has to do with the fact that it is an, an exceptionally good thing for finite persons that they believe about themselves that they are one created by a perfectly loving God and two that God is open to relationship with their mere finite selves. Only then can even a partial glimpse of God's purpose for their lives come into view. Premise three, therefore, if God exists, then there are no non-resistant non-believers. Schellenberg writes, the presence for God will be for them like a light that however much the degree of its brightness may fluctuate remains on unless they close their eyes. Premise four asserts that there are no or sorry, that there are or have been non-resistant non-believers. And then the conclusion here is that no perfectly loving God exists. So the um, argument is a valid argument. And so the question uh, that we should ask ourselves is how plausible do we find these premises? Are they, are they more plausible than not? Um, and so, you know, at this point, you know, the objections come rolling in. Well, thanks for that, Justin. Um, there's a lot of like interesting things to talk about here. So what I really yeah. want to do is kind of like look at some of these objections here and just kind of like think about them and just kind of go through them. Um, here's something that like I've thought about and I don't really yeah. have like an idea of like where this comes from. This idea mm -hmm. maybe a few years ago, like really hit my mind when thinking about like the hiddenness argument. And I'm like, yeah, I probably read it from somewhere. I was like, oh, this is actually like kind of interesting. And I, I find like I kind of put some stock in this objection. Um, mm -hmm. Granted, I haven't really seen any replies to it. But let's just think about this question of like, are there like non-resistant non-believers? Yeah. Um, one thought that's come to my mind when thinking about this idea is like, what what does it mean to be like a non-resistant non-believer? Um, so for example, like I thought about this in like the context of like desires. So say someone like, let's just say someone named Billy has a desire that's contrary to like, maybe like the desire of God, thinking of God as a perfect mm -hmm. being. So like say Billy has like the desire to lie, um, a perfect being God, you would think in like, this is in a sense of like the, like the Nazis are not knocking on your door, um, asking where the Jews are, but like in a context where yeah. it'd be bad to lie, um, God wouldn't have that desire to lie. So in that case, then you think that like, maybe like Billy would have a desire contrary to God's. And if that's the case, like, would Billy be resistant to God and at some level because his desires are like, um, contradictory to God's. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, that's an interesting um, reply. Um, so, okay. So the, the idea is that if our desires are contrary to the desires of God, would that like, would that count as resistance to God? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I guess my, my initial thought is that no, it would not count as resistant. And my reasoning being that there doesn't seem to be anything like necessarily resistant than the idea of like two people um, for a time having opposing desires while also being open to relationship with each other. Um, and so we want to define, um, we want to define resistance in a way incompatible with openness, right? So in this sense, um, I mean, so you could think of like, uh, say, you know, some kid turns 18 and he's excited to vote in the election, right? So he votes, uh, he, he wants the, the Democrat to win, right? So he, he, you know, puts his vote in and his mm -hmm. parents, uh, they have an opposite desire. And so they want to vote for the Republican candidate, right? Now, both of their uh, hopes are, it, it's just going to be the case that you know, someone's going to be disappointed, possibly both of them, right? Uh, if we mm -hmm. get a surprise <laughs> green ticket, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the, the point being is that there's still going to be a relationship there, um, that, the, that you can have these desires for things that are incompatible, but nevertheless, it still be uh, coherent to say that uh, they are open or even fully engaged in a relationship with each other. 
Um, and so, yeah, I guess that's what I, I would say about that. So like in your example, right? So somebody who has a desire to perform a, a, a sin or a morally wrong act, um, having such a desire, it seems to me, is perfectly consistent with being open to a relationship with God as well, right? It just involves some confusion on the part of the person, right? Or some ignorance on the part of the person about moral uh, moral facts. Um, and so it seems to me that actually uh, desires of this sort, if anything, such desires in a person would further motivate God's openness to such a person, um, so long as they're not resisting, because God would be able to, over time, within a relationship, reorient those desires in a freedom-preserving way, um, and within the context of a dynamic relationship with his beloved. Um, so rather than being an objection, I think that it does certainly help to clarify um, resistance, but I don't think that it would serve as an objection per se. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about like non-resistance, Justin, yeah. what you're trying to say is, is this isn't the idea that like, oh, like someone is like, maybe like totally open, there's nothing wrong with them. Like, they're just like this perfect, like, um, person like waiting for like God to come upon them. But it's yeah. more this idea of like a person that's just like genuinely just like, like if you ask them like, hey, like, are you open to like knowing God? They're like, yeah, I, w I am open to knowing God. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly consistent with people being, I mean, remember, right, we're, we're talking about um well if god exists right then we are the product of of god's divine will uh we exist because of that and mm -hmm. but we exist in a particular way right we exist as finite persons uh we're we're immature morally we're immature relationally we're immature rationally um we're immature morally i mean that that's quite clear i mean you have entire theodicies dedicated to focusing on that aspect of us, our moral immaturity. And so it seems to me like it can't be the case that God chooses to create morally immature persons and then use that as a reason not to bring about their greatest good, which is a potential for a relationship with them. You know what I mean? Um, so that's what, that's what I would kind of want to say about that, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm just trying to make sure like I, I'm grasping what you're saying because at least like yeah. when I've thought about this objection, the way I've thought about it is probably pretty black and white where I'm like, well, to say that someone is non-resistant means that like, there's nothing that would like um, come between like them and God and say that they have a desire that would come between like them and God that would make them like resistant. And this idea of like non-resistant, non-resistant unbelievers is just right. gone because everyone would be resistant to like some degree. Um, and that's kind of what I've like, that's kind of like when yeah. I, thought about this objection that's kind of where i'm at so yeah what do you yeah think? no i i totally understand uh i think that that's a um that that's not an uncommon intuition right um mm -hmm. but again i do think it's important to focus on the fact of how we were created right because i mean at the end of the day if um we're defining resistance in a way where there's just some kind of less perfect relationship that would be entered into then all everyone's going to be resistant right <clears throat> excuse me if god create <clears throat> i have a frog inside of my throat um uh, <laughs> if it's the case that god has created us the way we are like we are just like we're rationally immature again like all those various ways that we're immature it doesn't make sense that god would use that against us as a reason to not um make available to us the greatest good for us which is a a developing and dynamic relationship with God. One thing that the one thing that's important to point out, I think, about the hiddenness argument is that it, it's not saying that, um, well, it's saying that a relationship with God will be, in some sense at least, like a relationship with humans, where they start off imperfectly. Um, you know, your best friend, you probably started your relationship off in a less than like perfect way. You know, you didn't like mm -hmm. we perfectly other, agree on just... everything. Right, right. You have little arguments here and, you know, and, and perhaps those are the best kinds of people to have arguments with because they can really hold you to account. Um, and so that's the kind of honesty that relationships demand and that kind of confrontation of each other's limits, the kind of ability to, to, um, to uh, what's the word, uh, challenge each other, right? Obviously, in a, in a relationship with God, there's not much to challenge God on, right? In fact, there's nothing to challenge God on. The persons can think there is, but in response, God will within that relationship 
show them, connect the dots for them. They'll be like, look, you're misunderstanding the issue. As friends do, they help each other, they correct each other, they improve each other. And so I think that that's the kind of relationship we're talking about. It's a rich, dynamic relationship. Um, much like, um, you know, if you're suffering, you, you know, you, you shake your fist at God. God doesn't abandon you in that second. God within that relationship with you fosters that, shepherds you toward the proper understanding of, of uh, either your own humility, like, you know, you know, don't be so Jobish, you know, step, step down. Um, and uh, yeah, just a, a, a more humble approach to God and his relationship to moral facts, his relationship to human suffering. So those are the kinds of things that Schellenberg wants to allow for in this argument. He wants to allow for that rich, dynamic uh, relationship. Okay, yeah, that's helpful, Justin. So one maybe like clarification here. Um, this isn't something where like where I'm trying to like score points or anything like that, but maybe just like for me, sure. like syntactically, like just thinking about like Schellenberg's argument is like maybe like for me, like when I personally think about like non-resistant, I'm thinking of someone that has like no like contrary like desires, like they're just totally open to God, like in every sense yeah. of the imagination. And it seems like to me, like you're willing to say, and please correct me where I'm wrong, that like maybe sure. like in the sense of like desires, maybe they are like. I don't want to say resistant, but like they may have conflicting desires with God. And like, that's in some sense. Okay. Because what you're thinking about is more like the idea of like genuinely like being open to God. Right, right, right. So long as you're not like, it's about like, um, well, one metaphor that Schellenberg uses that I think is like, it really does help to explain a lot is that uh, God for them. And by them, he just means all created persons. God for them will be like a light that however much the degree of its brightness may fluctuate, nevertheless remains on unless they close their eyes. So the light's going to shine. The only thing that prevents that light from getting to their eyes is them willingly putting something in between them and God. That, uh, mm -hmm. you know, their eyelids in this case, but, uh, you know, the, the metaphor isn't taken literally. It's just, uh, you know, the idea of, um, you know, if you are, you know, people who are, are um, self-deceiving themselves, right? Like, let's say someone who, um, I don't know, for whatever reason, like, let's say they enjoy this particular sin, right? Or, mm -hmm. you know, I don't really like that word necessarily, but we can use it in this context. This, you know, this person wants to, is enjoying this, uh, this morally impermissible act that they know is wrong, right? So they, they are, like, they grasp the moral fact of the wrongness of the act, right? But, and they, and they know that God would grasp this. And so they would, perhaps they would resist uh, God in this way because they want to continue to do this immoral act. And so, you know, they're, they convince themselves that God does not exist and God's not going to shine his light in their face if they're wanting to resist, right? So, mm -hmm. so long as they have this kind of positive, uh, anti-God attitude, um, so long as that's maintained, God's light's not going to touch them. And mm -hmm. the second they are like, the second they show a kind of humility, a, an openness to God, um, on goes the light. Hmm. Okay. Um, I'll leave this to you, Justin, and we can move on because I'm going to make sure since I'm sure. raising the objections, you get the last word. Anything else you want to say about this before we move to another objection? Um, so you started the... Um, that objection noting that like, you know, questioning the, the, whether or not uh, we could say that non-resistant non-believers exist. And I do want to make a, 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 sm a small case for their existence mm -hmm. because I do okay. think this is a common, a common reply. Um, so you could put people in a couple of different categories, um, plausible examples of non-resistant non-believers in a couple of different categories. So on the one hand, you have isolated non-theists, so these are people that throughout time have completely just, just lacked the concept of God. Uh, maybe they have other religious concepts of uh, maybe finite but immaterial minds, uh, animism, or you know various religious concepts that we know of, polytheism, things like this. But like the idea of a all-powerful, all-knowing, all morally perfect God, those concept that that concept has not hit them, has not reached them. Um, but people have had capacity for religious belief going back as, at least as far as 40,000 years. 
Um, and if the if burial practices uh, suggest religious belief, then it's at least twice that. Like, so the question isn't whether or not any exists necessarily right in this second. The question is all throughout religiously thinking human history, has anyone ever like maybe just had an indifference to the idea of God or not even thought of it or, you know, various things like that. So it seems really probable that someone, you know, even if, you know, the, people you interact with, you don't necessarily think that they're non-resistant in this way. Um, clearly some people have, at least I would argue. Um, others are former believers. Um, these are people that who have, who have thought themselves to be in a relationship with God, but because of various things, changes in um, cognitive approaches to certain facts about the world, they start to fall away from it. Um, I don't know if you've ever struggled with doubt, but it's a very much a thing that is against your will. Um, when I kind of fell out of my religious belief, it was absolutely something that was like absolutely against my will. It was not something I welcomed at all. It was a very tumultuous, difficult time. Um, that said, you know, after once I kind of settle into the fact that I no longer have a religious belief, I'm going to like start to research and think about things and, and you know, how do I make sense of the world from this new perspective, right? But the transition itself was very much an uh, against my will kind of thing. And so I think that people of that sort uh, have clearly been non-resistantly, non-believing. Um, and other examples are people like apatheists, people who have heard of the concept of God, but they're not really, they just never really thought about it much. They It's just kind of like, in the background, um, they they live their lives. They don't really think about these concepts. Those persons, those persons, it seems to me, are, are plausibly non-resistantly non-believing as well, um, as well as agnostics, right? People who just think that the world. I mean, you can be agnostic for a couple of different reasons, but for example, someone who just thinks that the world is religiously ambiguous, and so they don't really like. They just earnestly don't know <laughs> what's true, whether or not God does or does not exist. Um, these are people that it seems to me um, would be plausible uh, examples of non-resistant non-believers. Um, and then, of course, there's just the strong evidence for this in the sense of testimony from people saying as much. And I think that testimony should be treated as innocent until proven guilty. So those are some reasons I think that people should find this premise to be more plausible than not. Okay, yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you, Justin. Let's look at another objection, um, and this is the idea, maybe more of like a defense or a theodicy, that says that maybe like there are the like non-resistant non-believers, and this is because they would enter like into perhaps an improper relationship with God. Some people mm. may point to different like aspects of this. So some may say that like some people would just like immediately reject the relationship with God once they were offered yeah. to it. Um, some may say that like some non-theists would just perpetually form like an improper relationship with God. Some might think that like some potential converts may like abandon this relationship at like a later point in life. Um, yeah. So there's just a few different like options there. So what do you kind of yeah. make of this objection, Justin? Yeah. So um, I think, uh, well, yeah. So I guess I would, some of that's going to be a little bit of a, um, well, I guess let me just say this. Um, it would be unclear exactly what is being meant by improper relationship here. Um, mm -hmm. In this context, you know, the focus is going to be, again, on finite persons who are, by divine choice, morally and relationally immature persons. Um, and if that's true, there's a sense in which any new relationship involving finite persons begins imperfectly, begins improperly, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that we can clearly see this when we reflect on, like, our own lives, our own relationships, you know, as we were talking about before. Um, so then you can you can kind of consider a finite person who, because of their belief in God, um, enters, um, you know, makes an overture toward relationship with God um, and enters a relationship with them. So prior to then, they might have superficial propositional knowledge of God and perhaps some superficial experiential knowledge. But upon entering that relationship, um, it's going to be far from ideal. And so, so in that sense, it'll be improper in that way. Um, they simply do not understand the full weight of what it actually means for God to exist. They just know the simple fact that he does, in fact, exist. 
Um, and so you could imagine that like time passes and the finite person acquires further experiential knowledge of God and knowledge of the depths of God's infinite moral knowledge. The relationship deepens. The growing richness and depth of such a relationship would be an incredibly exciting and rewarding for them uh, and fulfilling uh, them as a, as a finite person. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be overall, um, or it's after all going to be an objectively the most valuable thing for that person. And mm -hmm. as a result, the person's moral character and, and maturity would improve. They would inevitably begin to grow and then have more control over their own actions. They'd be less subject to irrational desires. God lovingly shepherds that finite person in a freedom preserving way toward all of these great goods. And so you're going to have this, as long as that person remains open to that relationship, God's going to shepherd them along in growth. And so it's always going to be a, um, a dynamic and uh, at times improving, at times falling back, at times improving. It's going to be a relationship with a finite person. God created finite persons. He can only ever hope to have a relationship with finite persons. And so that's the kind of relationship that would occur. Um, and it would be the best thing for those finite persons. Hmm. So it seems like to me, like the reply here into this idea of like an improper relationship is to think that like, if we're really talking about like, like God, a perfect being, like perfect goodness, yeah. perfect rationality, perfect love, uh, any relationship with God might be better than like no relationship with God. And that's kind of what you're going for. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly it's going to be the case that when you're in relationship with someone, I mean, so yeah, it's exactly what you said. So any relationship with God is going to be good uh, better than than no relationship with God. And that's because mm -hmm. of, again, the fact that it's an intrinsically good thing. It's good in and of itself that God is related to his persons and that they're sharing life together in that way. Um, but it's also going to be good because of the benefits accrued by the individuals involved. So God is going to genuinely enjoy relating to his persons. His persons are going to genuinely enjoy relating to God to different degrees at different times. Sure. But the relationship matters and it's, and it's occurring and that's what matters. Okay. So here's a interesting question. Like something that I literally, yeah. I don't even know really what to make of it. It's just something I thought about um, as you were talking, Justin. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the points that I brought up in like trying to frame this objection, and this isn't something that I'm like super like, Oh, I love this objection, but it's just something that I've thought about um, yeah. is one of the points of this is like potentially like, maybe God remains hidden and there are these non-resistant non-believers because some potential converts would abandon a proper relationship later in life. Um, one story, and this is just something that I've just totally thought of. And I'm like, I really don't know. So I'd be curious your thought yeah. is thinking about like the story of Judas, um, Judas, the betrayer of Jesus. He, yeah. in some sense, I don't want to get into like, was Judas a Christian? Da, 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 um, had a relationship with Jesus. Like he was walking with Jesus. Um, mm -hmm. And later Judas came to abandon that relationship um and like sell jesus out and all this stuff um and led to judas like committed suicide and all these things and i just kind of was thinking about this as you were talking justin i'm like was judas's life better because he had that relationship at one point and then like he lost it um and i just i don't really know what to make to think of this i literally just came up with this about like two minutes ago as i was just thinking about what yeah. you were saying so yeah no that's a an interesting idea so um let's see here uh, okay, so the idea be, so we're specifically talking about, about Judas in this sense. So in one thing that we gotta uh, gotta be careful of in discussing arguments of this sort is bringing into um, well, I'll, I'll say this. I, I don't think it is the case that if someone actually had so remember, I'm not assuming that God exists, right? Mm -hmm. what we yeah. need to do, we, we, we have to set that, as we can't talk about God in the actual world, right? So I think, uh, I'm, I'm persuaded that if God existed and people entered relationship with him, uh, there would never be a time where that relationship would end. Mm. They would, it, would, it would be dynamic. They would, they, God would bring some epistemic distance occasionally to maybe make a moral point. Um, there would be a kind of rich dynamic relationship between God and man, but it would never fully end. Um, and so I don't think, um, and because I don't think God exists, I, and because this argument is an argument against the existence of God, 
I don't think we can use like um, uh, stories or examples from this world, right? Because we want to say, we want to, the question is whether or not this world is compatible with the existence of a perfectly loving God. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I, th I, I think I get what you're saying. Cause you want to say like, we can't just like almost like assume these like action exa examples almost like actually happened. And what you're right. trying to wonder is like, like if in your view, like we're thinking about like there being this perfect being, um, there would be no persons who come to know this perfect being and they wouldn't want to like abandon that relationship at some point. Like that's just something that like wouldn't happen with your view. Right, right, right. Yeah. So yeah, I, and that's, yeah, exactly. So that's why I mean, like when we're like, it's, it's all fine and dandy to use stories as metaphors or to, to illustrate a point, but when, mm -hmm. when uh, describing them as things that happened in the actual world and squaring that with the existence of God, that's where you kind of got to be careful. You don't want to be like, you know, question begging in that sense. Right. So yeah, that's where there's got to be a, a, a mindfulness on, on that, on that end. Okay. Yeah. That's helpful. Anything else you want to say on this point, Justin, before we keep on rolling? Um, no, no, I, I, I think that that was an interesting, I think that was a good point. Cause I do think it's important to draw out the point that on this view that uh, Schellenberg uh, advocates that there's there's no reason to think that God, once a relationship begins, would lose his sheep at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so I think yeah. that that's yeah, it helps to bring helps to illustrate that point. So I, I value that. OK, thanks. Well, let's look at another objection, Justin. And this is the idea that maybe like God is hidden. Like there are these non-resistant non-believers because hiddenness allows for like great relationships with I guess, could, I guess we could go first with other humans and maybe we could even extend this like to God. Um, mm -hmm. But just thinking with the other, like, first, let's just start with like the human aspect of this. Like maybe you could point to things like say, like um, if, it, if we had a God um, who gave us like what we, everything we needed, um, maybe humans just like wouldn't desire a relationship like with each other. Um, and maybe it's a good thing that like ha that God is hidden because it allows humans to work together to make progress on questions such as like, does God exist? Um, yeah, or maybe yeah, yeah. like even practical things like science or like talking about like ethics, uh, things like this. So what are your thoughts here, Justin? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a number of points there. Um, all really, really good points. Um, what I would want to say um, is that, you know, you were, you were said, you had said something to the effect of if God or if, if humans were so occupied with their relationship with God, perhaps they wouldn't have relationships with other humans. Right. Um, but this, uh, so remember that the entire argument is based on the assumption that relationships are good in and of themselves and, and also good uh, for the um, various ways in which they benefit the participants. Um, so yes, while relationship with God would be the best thing for them, uh, clearly there would be very good reasons uh, for persons who are you know, adequately sensitive to these reasons to also have relationships with other persons. Um, so uh, I don't know that the mere existence of God and a relationship with God would necessarily, you know, uh, rob human relationships of their value in that way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and then you had said something to the effect of uh, the discovering the, the goodness of working together to discover something like the existence of God. Um, yeah. To that, I would argue that it, I would agree with you. First of all, uh, we're going to have common ground here in the sense of collaborative projects seeking to discover and learn things together is, is a fantastic and beautiful thing. Um, but those are things that can occur within relationship with God, right? So these are relationship compatible goods. Um, remember at the beginning of the presentation of the argument, I had mentioned that um, God's choice to create finite persons kind of illuminates the goods he's after. And these are relationship compatible goods. And so we can say that like the goodness of discovering things of working together, these collaborative projects are good things, but God is after the ones, those goods that are compatible with also being in a relationship with God. Um, and so at least with regard to the question of like discovering the existence of God, that's going to be one kind of discovery among many others. You can 
that's the only one that would be incompatible with also believing and, uh, you know, and being in a relationship with God. So it seems to me like God is not going to hide for the mere fact of learning whether or not God exists. A far deeper investigatory project would be people working together to learn all while in a relationship with God to learn and mind the depths of God's goodness, right? So that's kind of what I would want to say to that. I think while the existence of God is an interesting question to, to work together to discover, um, it's not, uh, you know, there are other goods that can be sought within a relationship with God and that are far deeper and far better and less superficial than the mere question of whether or not God exists, right? So that's a relatively superficial question relative to like the nature of God, the depths of God's goodness and things like that. Those discoveries are far richer and they're infinite. So, yeah, I guess that's what I would say to that. Yeah. One thing I wonder about, Justin, you're just kind of yeah. thinking through what you're talking about is like, what if like, I don't know, like, I think there is kind of like a good and like coming to like, just like discover God like on his own. Um, I don't know how good of an example this is going to be, but I just re recently finished the book. Um, it's called Paper Towns by John Green. It's kind of like a young adults novel, but I like kind of like yeah. trying to read outside of philosophy because it helps me like just kind of get away yeah. from it for a minute. It's nice to just... have a little casual reading for sure. Exactly. And I'm like, I'm not just like, like every board. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? I could just read. <laughs> um, and this is another example I'm just kind of coming up with on the spot. But sure. What I'm thinking about here, like in Paper Towns, like if you want to read the book, don't listen to anything I'm about to say to anyone listening. <laughs> um, what happens is one of the main characters, um, she just like disappears just off the face of the earth. Um, and the main character is like trying to figure out like, well, where did she go? Um, she leaves some clues and then she also is just like hidden. Um, and basically like the whole course of the novel is him just trying to figure out like where this girl is and like where she is. And he's, she's pursu he's pursuing her. He's pursuing her. Doesn't know. Um, and towards the end, he finds her um, yeah. and not in all the way that he, that she expected or that he expected, um, but they end up having this relationship out of it. that turns out to be, I would think more meaningful than if like none of that like ever occurred. So I guess like in like a very rough analogy, I'm thinking like maybe in the case of God, like maybe like God is like voluntarily like being like hiding himself, um, allowing saying like a non-resistant non-believer to like, keep pursuing keep pursuing and the discovery like when it happens would be even more beautiful than like it just happened um at this like precise moment right now so just curious yeah. what you think about that you yeah, know that's interesting so um one thing to consider here um so i think that all the points i made earlier do still apply but if we do want to focus specifically on the question of discovering the goodness of a project of discovering the fact that God exists um, rather than discovering facts about God's existence. Um, it seems to me like that kind of thing is compatible with um, being a resistant non-believer, right? Uh, presumably people think that, um, well, I would imagine that a lot of people think that because I run a podcast about atheism that I'm a resistant non-believer. I would object to that, but let's assume they're right. I am still investigating the existence of God, I think, in a very genuine way. I, at times, feel a great degree of cognitive dissonance, right? Um, I think anyone who reads philosophy on a topic um, is going to have those moments where things uh, appear less uh, clear to them. Um, or their 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 conclusion that they are that they find most at home uh, that that becomes less clear to them in various examples, right? So it seems to me like you could still investigate while being resistant. So I guess yeah, in that sense, there's a way in which that's entirely compatible with this with such a world. Um, so yeah, to to be clear, what I'm saying is that like. Say you you resist God, you don't want him to exist. Um, and so God does not has not revealed himself to you. So you are under the apparent belief that God does not exist. But say you're interested in philosophy, right? So you're going to start working with people and you're going to interact. And all of a sudden you're exploring the existence of God question. And you're going to explore the arguments. 
presumably we want to say that these arguments at least at least have the potential to change someone's mind. Um, and so in that sense, these arguments can serve to can serve as the bridge between the resistant non-believer to becoming a non-resistant non-believer, at which time God would be present to them. So I guess that's what I would say about that. It does seem like there's a way in which that's entirely compatible with um, the world I think would exist if, if God existed. Okay, so I just want to make sure I'm tracking with you, Justin. It yeah. seems like to me what you're thinking is you talked about like the arguments like for God um, yeah. and these can like serve as like a bridge to move people from like resistance to like non-resistance um, towards God. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of the question of like, then like, couldn't they actually like really come to like know or believe that God exists? Um, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'm confused with like, how is this relating then to like the idea that like, it'd be better maybe for someone, even if they are non-resistant to like come to know God, maybe like later in their stages of like non-resistance, um, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Well, so I don't think there's going to be a time. So I so maybe I misunderstood your objection, right? So you were saying you appealed to the goodness of the discovery of God's existence mm-hmm. um, as being a reason why God would allow for non-resistant non-belief. And my reply was to say that it doesn't follow from the from the goodness of that um to that there must be some time at which non-resistant non-believers exist so that that's my reply as i'm saying that like i think it's entirely coherent to say that someone who resists god would still investigate it um potentially would investigate it right they would explore the arguments maybe they're interested in that kind of thing and then the, occasionally these arguments over time become more convincing to a point where they cease in their resistance at which time god becomes apparent to them and so they no longer are a uh non-believing person because they are no longer a resistant person so it's almost like at that moment where like they kind of move from like non-resistance to like or sorry move from resistance yeah to once they become open to um, it exactly mm-hmm. then you would ex- um yeah you would expect like there to be like some sort of like divine revelation where they come to like know that like God exists. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be uh, like a flashing neon sign. Right. So these are, Mm -hmm. this can be a very subtle thing, just subtle enough to kind of uh, for them to be able to appreciate. um, And so to, to form a belief that God exists, it can be very, it doesn't have to be like a, you know, a, a Broadway production. It can be quite a subtle thing um and so yeah it it seems to me like that's an entirely coherent story um and you can tell that story and you can appreciate the goodness of the discovery of learning that god exists and none of that requires there to be a moment where there exists a non-resistant non-believing person okay so here's an interesting kind of like thought i had um, yeah. I remember reading a book about Mother Teresa um, a while back, and even like I was reading um, Anselm's like Proslogian, Proslogian. I have no clue how to say it. Um, <laughs> earlier, and, they, and both of them have had very similar moments. Um, Mother Teresa's, I think, lasting a lot longer, something like a dark night of the soul, yeah, where they yeah, come yeah. at it. And I know from Mother Teresa's, who's as far as I understand, many years where she, uh, I'll, I'll look up this book when you start talking. Um, she had this feeling of like, Oh, like they're like, she just didn't really like sense this presence of God at all. Like she lived her life, like serving the poor and like doing what she's doing without like this sense of like divine love, divine presence. Uh, but I think Christians would want to say that most like, if she was a Christian, like she did, or like a theist, she did have a relationship with God, like even yeah. through that. Um, so what do you make of like situations like that, Justin? Yeah, no, I think, I think it's entirely possible that, in a world where God exists and has created persons, that um, that it, these relationships would be dynamic in this way. Um, again, I don't want to, you know, assume that we're talking about the actual world, but let's say something like Mother Teresa happened in a world that I think is coherent with the existence of God, right? I think it, I think that's entirely consistent where someone who uh, devotes their life to a relationship with God. Um, 
but then nevertheless experiences epistemic distance from God um, in a way that is difficult for them. Um, but this could be a way by which God challenges them, perhaps to uh, make some, I don't know, changes or improvements or, or what have you. Um, the same kind of thing that we do um, in our relationships with our friends, uh, relationships with our parents, right? Like, you know, the cold shoulder, essentially, right? Like a divine cold shoulder. I mean, that's I'm being a little uh, facetious there, but there's mm -hmm. these are all moves that can be made within a relationship. And so uh, it seems to me like um, those are the kinds of things that are, are, are made possible in such a world. So it's almost like, like you could have like these dark night of the soul, almost moments of like feeling the void or something like that and still be in like some sort of like meaningful, like relationship with God. Yeah. I mean, so, so long as you're not resistant, God is going to be, uh, you're, you're going to be an apprehension of a belief in God. Um, though it might be very minimal. It might be like point, you know, point, uh, 0.5001 essentially. You know what I mean? Like just barely believing because of the kind of, you know, perhaps God's being distant to make a point or something. Right. But like, mm -hmm. you still think he probably exists. Um, but you know, it, it occurs within a relationship and it can be dynamic in that way. Okay. Yeah. That's helpful, Justin. Um, and I'll leave a link down below to this book I'm talking about, which is like mother Teresa come be my light. Um, it's just like the private writings of her that came out in a book. Uh, yeah. Like super interesting stuff. Or something like that. Yeah. Um, Hopefully the internet's holding on. My internet's been struggling of late, but I think we're good. Um, I guess maybe something that we could talk about, like, is, like, we've talked about, like, the idea of, like, humans having great relationships with other humans. Uh, we talked about the idea of, like, humans having great relationships with God. Um, and I think we've kind of addressed the idea of, like, God, like, participating, like, um, or God allowing us to participate in the world by his hiddenness um, and things like inquiry and things like that. Uh, before mm -hmm. we move on, is there anything else you want to say about any of those points, Justin? Um, not particularly, no. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, okay. it's been a great conversation so far. And I think we've explored quite a, quite a bit of ground there. So it's been enjoyable. Yeah. Well, let's look at like one more interesting question, um, before sure. we start to wrap up. And this is the question to me of like, is it possible that non-theists could have some relationship with God? Um, so maybe this is targeting when we're thinking mm. about like Schellenberg's argument, um, when saying like, well, like that there are these non-resistant non-believers, maybe some people want to push back and say, well, like actually they aren't non resistant non believers, they're just believers. Um, and maybe they just don't consciously like realize it. Um, yeah, William yeah. Wainwright, a professor, said, like, quote, when the non believer responds to the good she sees, she may be responding to God himself, end quote. Um, so what do you what do you make of that? Yeah, so well correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't maybe we're talking about different objections, but um, there are some uh, philosophers that have replied to the hiddenness argument in the, in the literature um, by saying something to the effect of relationship doesn't require belief. Is that what you're mm -hmm. indicating? Okay, so it's not I, that they... Yeah. Okay. I'm thinking okay, yeah, like so... this objection is kind of thinking that there are people who possibly um, maybe actually might be in a relationship with God. Um, yes. But yeah. they just aren't, they don't have necessarily like a conscious awareness of it per se. Yeah. Is that what kind of what the idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's, there are some interesting um, replies to that. Um, uh, Doherty and Poston and I think Cullison as well have published papers on this. And it's been, it's super interesting stuff. Um, so I, I, I got to admit, I find the claim a little odd. Um, it doesn't seem to me like, a perfectly loving God would want to settle for like this kind of abstract um, distant connection. And it, it's, it's hard for me to really see how that could be their greatest good for the person, I guess. And that's part of the reason why we're being motivated toward um, an explicit relationship, right? Um, because of the benefits accrued by the individuals that are participating and because of the, the intrinsic goodness itself. Um, it doesn't seem like if that is a relationship that that's a intrinsically good relationship, I guess is what I would argue. Um, there's also um, the fact that, uh, you know, again, I would, I would go back to the fact that one of the most important goods here purchased with belief in God 
has to do with the fact that it's an exceptionally good thing for finite persons to believe, to be aware that they themselves are, um, that they that they come to believe of themselves, that they are created by a perfectly loving God and that God is open to relationship with their mere finite selves. Um, so it does seem to me like it does kind of, like a, a full robust view of divine human relations is going to be, is going to involve a human, a human's recognition um, and belief in the fact that they have been created by a perfectly loving God. And that, it seems to me, a belief of that sort requires a belief in the existence of God, right? So um, that's going to be all kind of tied up in like their purpose, like their value as persons. All of those things are going to be, um, you know, if, if we get our value as persons from God, then this is going to, it's going to be, it's going to require us to have that kind of explicit belief in God, it seems to me. Okay, yeah, this is helpful, Justin. So what you're thinking about here is the idea that like, would you say that at least like, let's start with this, like, is it possible? Like, do you think like in the conceptual instinct that there would be people who maybe, um, who don't like have that intellectual belief in God, but actually are in a relationship with God? Like, do you think that's possible um, in the first place? I, I, I don't think it's possible. Like it, it, it doesn't okay. really make sense to me, I guess, is what I would say. Um, and I think that if that kind of thing is possible in the, if there's some kind of abstract sense in which someone can have a relationship with a God, it doesn't seem like that's the kind of relationship, like if that counts as a relationship at all, which I'm very skeptical of, it doesn't seem like that's the kind of relationship God would be after, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because he created us, like he didn't have to create us. He created us for a reason. He created us uh, as finite persons. Um, and it's a very good thing for us to be in a relationship with God in an explicit way, because the explicit way allows us to believe of ourselves that we're created by God and to believe of ourselves that we value or that, uh, that God values us in that way and has a purpose for our lives. And all those things are going to require that more explicit form of belief. And that's the kind of cat's pajamas of kinds of relationships that, that only a divine being would really be seeking. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's helpful. So what do you make of something like, are you familiar on I'm sure you are um, with like the CS Lewis and the last battle and like that situation with like cash and like the person that, um, that came to believe in like the false God ended up like knowing like the true God? Like, Are you familiar with that situation? Mm, very vaguely. Um, tell me the story. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll, what I'll do is I'll just read a quote for you. Um, sure. And it's from C.S. Lewis in The Last Battle, and he's kind of looking at this idea um, from a different angle. But here's what C.S. Lewis says, and I'll just read a quote. Um, and he says, then I fell, and this is a, this is a story, this is part of the Chronicles of Narnia like, series. Um, yeah. And it says, then I fell at his feet and thought, surely this is the hour of death. For the lion, um, and in Lewis's case, the lion means Jesus, who is worthy of all honor, would know that I have served Tash all my days and not him. Nevertheless, it is better to see the lion and die than to be Tisrock of the world and live and not to have seen him. But the glorious one bent down his golden head and touched my forehead with his tongue and said, Son, thou art welcome. But I said, Alas, Lord, I am no son of thine, but the servant of Tash. He answered, Child, all the service thou hast done to Tash, I count as service done to me. Then by reason of my great desire for wisdom and understanding, I overcame my fear and questioned the glorious one, and, da, da, da. and there's it, there's a lot more here um but that's yeah, kind of yeah, like yeah. the gist of what lewis is getting at and this idea of like hey there's this person um uh who was serving tash who's the false god his whole life he thought he was like following god and doing all these things um yeah. and he realizes like he was just wrong and then he but in, in this case um the lion um representing jesus like counts that service is like service to god um so it's like someone genuine seeking genuinely like seeking god um yeah. but they come to like the wrong conclusion but then right, it's like, right, right. kind of there's something there that, yeah. So what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I don't think that would ever happen. <laughs> I mean, I mean, certainly, <laughs> certainly it's the case, <laughs> certainly it's the case that in the actual world you have religious disagreement. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But of course I'm going to think that religious disagreement is quite surprising on theism. Right. Um, so it makes sense to say that, you know, in a world where religious disagreement is, is, 
you know, widespread, it makes sense that theology is going to have these kind of these kinds of tools to to have a story here, right? But it seems mm-hmm. to me like, um, I mean, I guess the question you would ask in that in that scenario is is the the individual are they resistant to Aslan or or are they open to it? They're just like mistakenly um, selected the wrong name under which to to you know to give their praise. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like if they're okay. resistant, then then you know by all means, Aslan has no obligation to reveal himself, right? But um, mm-hmm. If they're not, and um, if they're open to the kind of divine authority, if, if that's not a problem for them, um, if they're willing to be, to submit and dedicate their lives to the purpose of the divine, then, you know, presumably Aslan would have been like, that's me, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't think that really, I don't think that... Um, I guess my point being that like the religious disagreement of the actual world, I think that God would have prevented that and would have been like, Hey, guess what? Here's how I want you to relate to me. It's not that way. Like I appreciate your attitude of, of submission and um, a bending of the knee to divine authority, but you're bending in the wrong direction. You gotta, Mm -hmm. you gotta be facing me. Right. That's what God would do, it seems to me. He would correct the confusion because that confusion is a big problem. It it brings in tension. It brings people into tension, family members, um, you know, into tension with each other. Here's how God wants to relate to people. No, here's how God wants to relate to people. It also then, that introduces tension in between those persons and God, if he exists. Um, So all this kind of confusion, it seems to me, is very much uh, antithetical to the whole purpose for which we were created if, if God exists. And so I don't think that, the, that this kind of stuff would exist either. Um, but that's, again, another, that's a hiddenness argument that fits in with that broader category of hiddenness. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's almost like you're thinking that like this kind of scenario, like you said, just like wouldn't happen in the actual world because like God would like reveal himself to anyone who is genuinely open. Um, they wouldn't be mistaken right. about like who God is. Yeah, okay, all that's these helpful. theists not... around the world, yeah, all these theists around the world of different stripes would, because of their openness, they would be in possession of belief in God. So, yeah, exactly mm-hmm. what you said. Yeah, that's something interesting and definitely worth thinking about. Justin, anything else you want to say about like divine hiddenness and whatnot before we start to wrap up here? Um, no, no, I, I'll just say that I really appreciated this conversation and. Um, and uh, I I appreciate anyone who wants to you know delve into sophisticated defenses of of positions they are opposed to right so I I can appreciate that so so That's I appreciate you having me on yeah and I appreciate you coming on um, I really appreciate like what you guys are doing at like real atheology um, it's just very helpful and I think that like. Anyone, um, regardless of like what side of this, like theism, atheism, agnosticism, like this whole debate, if they open it, come at it from like an open spirit and an open mind and are willing to just like dialogue and do it like respectfully and humbly. I think it's like a really like it's a big gift to the world um, to have like dialogues like this and to have channels like you guys where I mean, I disagree with a lot of what you guys say, but like like it's very humble and it's intellectually rigorous and it's honest um and it's just kind-hearted in its intent and i really appreciate what you guys are doing so well, i really appreciate that, that Zach. Mm-hmm. yeah um so maybe justin like share like how can people like follow you connect with you things like that and like what projects are you working on in the future sure sure um so uh, as you mentioned you know Roman, or um, i co-host the relay theology podcast Um, occasionally I do, um, public events, debates and things. Um, I recently did a debate, a debate, uh, with, um, apologist Eric Hernandez down in Texas, um, hosted by Capturing Christianity, which uh, people can check out. Um, that's, I, I I was actually, I stepped away from this philosophy, religion stuff for about four years or so. And that was like my kind of, uh, homecoming (laughs) event. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I think, um, if people are interested, they can check that out. They can check out the uh, the YouTube page. They can check out the podcast as well. Well, it's awesome that you're back in this world, Justin. And I can't wait to see what you're doing in the future. And I'm sure 
at some point we'll have you on again to talk about something who knows what um but yeah thank you so much for coming on justin i'll leave a link down below to relate theology you can check it out and i'll try to leave a link down to justin's twitter where you can follow him and see everything that's going on and yeah that's that thank you everyone for tuning in um if you enjoyed hearing apologetics i encourage you to like subscribe all that fun stuff and if you value what we do please consider becoming a patron. You can go do that at patreon.com so you can apologize and you can support for as little as a dollar a month. And that would be huge. Um, and thank you everyone for listening.